My name is Judy Rosenthal. I'm part of the Climate Action Coffee Group, um, which I'll tell you about in a moment. But just to let you know, this is being recorded. So if you would prefer not to be recorded, please turn off your recording in progress. There you go. Okay. So welcome, and thank you all for joining Climate Action Coffee and the City of Tacoma Park this evening to celebrate National Pollinator Week. Um, if you don't mind, please put in the chat where you're from. We're curious where everybody's coming from who's here. And it seems like pollinators and native plantings are taking off, and it's a tribute to our community that so many of us are here to explore this together. We had a fabulous kickoff this past Saturday at the gazebo. Other events planned include a table at the Crossroads Farmer's Market tomorrow, Wednesday. And you can use the guided neighborhood maps created by Climate Action Coffee to see how your neighbors are using native plants in their yards. All of these links that I will refer to or the presenters will refer to will be in the chat in a little bit. Um, and a big thank you to the city of Tacoma Park for hosting this event along with Climate Action Coffee which is a local group of citizens working on projects that deal with climate change. Climate Action Coffee is part of Tacoma Mobilization and we meet every Wednesday morning at 8 a.m. currently on Zoom and perhaps soon to be back in person. Anyone is welcome to join us and you can find the link for our Zoom meetings at tpmobilization.org backslash tally, which is T-A-L-L-E and that'll be in the chat later too. Thank you too to Mayor Stewart for joining us to welcome you to Gina Mathias, the sustainability coordinator who helped pull this together, to Cindy Dybala, city council for initiating the contact with the city, to Tacoma TV for their technical support and to all the people who helped get the word out about this evening's forum. And of course, to our four presenters who have generously given their time to share with us tonight. Tonight, we'll focus on the importance of pollinators and what we can do to encourage more of them in our environment and expand the so needed pollinator highway. If you've watched the Doug Tallamy video tonight, we'll re reinforce and build on his work. And if you could keep yourself muted now until the Q&A, <coughs> I will introduce the speakers in a moment following the mayor. So here is Mayor Stewart. I did unmute, I did unmute. Great. Um, thank you, Judith. Welcome, everyone. Um, thank you for joining us this evening for this terrific program. First, I want to thank, um, again, the organizers for tonight, um, and really not just for tonight, but for this whole inaugural Tacoma Park Pollinators Week. Um, it is such a great thing that we're doing, um, that you all are really doing. Um, so thank you to Climate Action Coffee and um, the City of Tacoma Park, especially our sustainability manager, Gina Mathias, for all her work. Um, I also want to thank the presenters for sharing their time and their expertise on this very important and timely topic. You know, as I look back over the last um, 15 or 16 months, I think that there are some things um, about having to spend more time um, in our homes is kind of a plus. Um, for those of us lucky enough to live where we either have a backyard or a windowsill or some place that we can plant, um, we've been able to spend much more time thinking about um, and sometimes worrying about the disrepair of our, uh, you know, uh, areas uh, in our in our homes, around our homes. Um, but with the help of groups like you and residents, we've been really able to think about in our community how we can enrich our gardens with an eye towards planting um, native plants and attracting more wildlife. And I'm really excited about tonight um, because it has something for everyone. Um, personally, as someone who is not an experienced gardener, I'm very much looking forward to learning, um, as I have been over the last few months for many of you. And I know tonight the panel also has something for even the most experienced gardener to learn. Uh, intentionally thinking about what we plant and learning about what is native and how to incorporate into our yards, our back balconies, or our front steps is so important. It can have a real impact on um, being able to provide a continuous habitat for birds, bees, and butterflies throughout our neighborhoods. You know, I just heard the term pollinator highway um, a number of years ago um, from a resident of Tacoma Park, of course. Um, and it is such a great concept because it's one that all of us can really contribute to in our own way, in our communities. Um, and so I'm glad to be here tonight to learn more about that. 
And being able to identify native plants, um, which is also a fun thing to learn how to do as we're walking around our neighborhood. Um, I've actually started doing it, posting pictures on Facebook and other places, just asking people, what is this? Um, and you learn so much um, because we have a community that is just so well informed on these issues. Um, but it also encourages others to do the same, um, to have these conversations about native plants, why they're important to plant. Um, because it matters not just for uh, the beauty of our community, um, for the wildlife, but it also contributes to ensuring that we have a sustainable food supply. It also contributes to us helping to mitigate stormwater and to mitigate the impacts of climate change. So we're going to hear about all of that this evening. So I'm going to stop talking so we can get to the heart of the program. And I just want to thank again to um, everyone who helped put together this evening and the presenters. Thank you. Thank you. And um, we, I will introduce the speakers now. We have four incredibly experienced and knowledgeable speakers who will talk about 15, 10 to 12 minutes, leaving time at the end for questions. And as I said earlier, many of the links, the, re the programs that they mentioned, the links will be put into the chat so you'll have them. So a very warm welcome to our speakers who are Anahi Espindola is a, an assistant professor at the Department of Entomology at the University of Maryland College Park. She works on understanding how changes in the environment affect the way plants and their pollinators interact. She studies the ecology and evolution of specialized pollination interactions and of pollination in endangered habitats. Anahi also contributes to science podcasts, publishes articles, contributes monthly to the University of Maryland Extension Home and Garden Information Center, and has launched a blog on environmental practices for Maryland gardeners, horticulturists, and farmers in Spanish. Anahi is from Argentina and will be happy to respond to questions in Spanish as well. Naomi Edelson is the Senior Director for Wildlife Partnerships at National Wildlife Federation. She works to prevent wildlife from becoming endangered, including legislative and grassroots and coalition building and the federal program Recovering America's Wildlife Act campaign. Naomi has developed a toolkit for wildlife leaders on strengthening state wildlife agencies and she also works with the Gardening for Wildlife program to restore wildlife habitat and created the Native Plant Finder and Sacred Grounds, a program for faith communities. Naomi is a wildlife biologist with an MS from the University of Florida where she studied wading birds and wetlands and has a BS from the University of Massachusetts at Amherst. She is one of our own living in Tacoma Park. <laughs> Lauren Hubbard works with, is the owner of Native by Design. She works with property owners and organizations providing sustainable landscaping services, including design, coaching, small scale installations and project management, as well as operating a nursery, offering local ecotype native plants. She's on the board of the Maryland Native Plant Society and has a particular interest in the preservation of genetic diversity in our native plant populations. Lauren launched the Butterfly Bandwagon Project, a neighbor to neighbor information and resource sharing approach to promote and support the use of native plants in landscaping. She holds a PhD in plant biology and is a certified Chesapeake Bay landscape professional, weed warrior and master gardener. And Lauren Wheeler has been a practicing landscape design professional for over 35 years. She is the founder and principal designer at Nat Natural Resources Design Inc., an ecological landscape design firm that specializes in natural systems, ecological preservation, and stormwater management. Ms. Wheeler has been designing and overseeing the installation of stormwater management facilities for municipalities since 2006. She was the lead designer on Maryland's first living building challenge, LEED, the lead platinum certified residential landscape, Maryland's first municipal natu natural play park, Constitution Gardens Park, and others, including the city of Tacoma Park stormwater management projects, Spring Park renovation, and the Sherman Avenue erosion control and step pools. She received her master's of science from the Conway School of Landscape Design and Planning. Welcome to you all, and we're very grateful for you being here, and we will get started with Anahi. So you all can hear me, I hope. Uh, oh wait, I'm not doing the right things in the right order. Okay. Okay, can you hear, can you see this and hear me, I guess? 
since people are nodding, <laughs> that's great. Okay, so let me put this in full screen. There we go. So yeah, hi everybody. This is really exciting to me. And uh, so I wanted to uh, thank everybody, all the organizers and everybody who came to, you know, listen and watch all these talks. I have to say that I'm really humbled to be here. I feel that I'm like this person and surrounded by all these people that know more than I do. But I'm hoping that I'll be able to share some of the things that I know and, you know, that are kind of reflected in the work that I do. So my name is Anaïs Espindola, and I'm an assistant professor at the University of Maryland. Um, I have my website in there. And today, you know, we're here because we are also um, joining this national celebration of Pollinator Week. And uh, in this talk, you know, I was thinking about what I could, uh, you know, share with you all and what could be interesting and what I could contribute to this discussion. And, you know, as uh, Judy said, I, I work on pollination, right? And so I do a lot of more conceptual work on pollination, even though I do also some applied work as well. And so I thought that the thing that I can contribute to you all is maybe providing um, a little bit of an overview of what is the knowledge that we have that comes directly from research on uh, pollinators and pollination. And so, you know, I wanted to kind of connect this to the world. And, you know, we, we see that everywhere we're seeing all these news about pollinators, right? And so it seems like pollinators are in the news all the time. And here are some print screens I got from <laughs> some websites. And we can see that they need our help. And it seems like they, they need us. We need to save the bumblebees. They apparently in, in Britain, there's many pollinated insects in, insects in decline. This uh, article about monarch butterflies that are almost extinct in California that came out a couple of days ago, actually. You know, it seems like there's all this need to protect pollinators. But I think that, you know, especially given the times that we live in, uh, we could ask ourselves, you know, the pollinators are in the news, but is it true that they are really dying? You know, the news can say things, but is this really true? And I hope that, you know, by the end of today, you'll have some um, kind of hard information about what really the research is showing on pollinators and pollination and the status of pollinators. Um, globally and then locally as well. So are they really dying? Um, if we think about studies that have studied um, pollination and pollinators, uh, we can think about this at many, many different scales. Um, here, I wanted to show you some uh, studies that were done at pretty large scales. These are studies done at, the, at national or global scales. And so these are studies that uh, were done mostly in Europe. Most of the pollinator studies uh, that have long-term survey data are actually from Europe because Europe has been collecting this data for a long time. And in these studies that are pretty recent, we can see uh, different things. And I'm going to just walk you through these images because I think that it's they are really useful. In this figure, in this figure up here, and I hope that you can see my my mouse. But in the figure on the top uh, left. Yes, on the top left, uh, we see the trends in pollinator uh, occupancy. So this is the, how widespread the populations of these pollinators are across time. And so on the top line, the red line corresponds to bees. The lower line corresponds to hoverflies that are some of the most important pollinators that exist besides bees. And they are usually not recognized sufficiently as the great pollinators that they are. And as we can see in this figure, we see that overall, starting at about 1980, we are having trends going, uh, you know, falling, um, going down uh, for both populations and abundances of bees and hoverflies. This is at the scale of Europe. Uh, of Europe. On the right here, we see um, two studies that were done in Britain and in the Netherlands, where people were trying to see what were the trends in the presences of pollinators, of two groups of pollinators, again, bees and uh, hoverflies, serpents, um, in, this, in these countries. Here, the cells that you can see uh, represent the differences in the abundances of these pollinators over time. And so if the cells tend to turn red, it means that in those areas, there has been a decrease in the pollinators or well, that group over the period of time that is evaluated. And here it's about 100 years. And if the cells turn bluish, they indicate that there's an increase of those groups. And as we can see, the bees are seem to be declining very strongly, both in Britain and in the Netherlands. 
um, surface seem to be presenting a relatively strong decline in Britain, and there is a mm, slight decline, but maybe also an increase depending on the areas in the Netherlands. And we think today that some of these trends that we're seeing here are really due to increasing um, numbers of surveys that are being done. So it seems we, we have these general um, studies that are indicating that these groups of pollinators that are important are trending down at large scales. Now, what's going on in the US? In the US, there aren't many um, studies that have been done like the ones that we just showed before. Um, but there have been some general studies that were done. In this study here that is from 2016, um, we have the evaluation of trends and the probability of certain trends to continue across the country um, based on numbers that have been surveyed over time. And here we see that the regions that appear in red are regions that have a very high probability of those trends going down, continuing to decline. Regions that are in blue, the darker the blue, the higher is the trend towards an upwards, uh, an increase in the, in the abundances of these, of these pollinators. And what we can see here is that most of the country is actually in red, and there are some regions that are in blue, which may seem like a really good news. The problem is, is that those regions that are in blue are regions that have recently received more attention on these groups, and so surveys have been significantly increased in recent years, and that makes that suddenly we see a trend in increase in the populations, but actually it's very likely that also these regions are following this overall trend um, that is shown in those red areas towards going down. And so in most regions of the US, even with the data that we have today, we can see that there is a pretty widespread decrease, decline in bee abundances across um, the continental United States. Now, what's happening at the scale of Maryland? You know, these are general, we've been seeing kind of the big picture, but what's going on here? In here, we have been doing uh, some studies recently, and we are um, estimating right now that about 10% of all bees that we currently have in Maryland, and those are about 450 species of wild bees that are native to Maryland, are likely in need of protection because they are actually starting to show characteristics of decline. And these are really, uh, this 10% of bees really represent um, those, those species that are showing a very strong indication of decline. There are, of course, other species that are not within this 10% that are having decline, trends of decline, but are not as strong as these ones that are shown here. And so we're seeing that both at the global, the national, and the local scale, we are having these trends towards reductions in the abundances and the diversities of this of this bee. And so, you know, this this is what the data is showing us. But I like to kind of think about, you know, you know, why would we care about these things going down? You know, why would, would we care about these bees disappearing or or being having populations reductions and, and diversity losses? And I think that there's different answers to that question, but I think that it, this is a very good question to ask ourselves. What we're seeing based on uh, studies, this is a study that came out uh, um, from a global analysis of pollinator trends and the effects on, on different ecosystem services that pollinators provide, is that we're growing over time more crops that are at the global scale, more crops that are more dependent on pollinators. And so here in this figure here on the left, we can see the, um, the cultivated area, so the increase in this case of the cultivated area for crops that are dependent on pollinators for producing uh, fruit and, and, and yield, and those that are non dependent over time. And so we see that over time, the acreage or the area that is cultivated by this, with these crops has been increasing constantly. On the other hand, on, in this same study, it was shown that about 85% of all the leading crops that we currently use um, would, would have a relatively significant reduction in yield if we start losing pollinators. And so it seems that we're growing more crops that are dependent on pollinators, and at the same time, we are losing pollinators. And those crops that are depending on pollinators are going to produce less food if we continue in this trend. 
On the other hand, we know also that pollinators are not just important for food. Actually, pollinators are central for, to the reproduction of about 85% of wild plants across the world. So about 85% of wild plants are not able to properly reproduce if there are no pollinators around. And so this, is, this uh, figure here comes from a study uh, that was done some years ago. And here we have the proportion of uh, pollinated plants um, that are depending on, on animals in different um, regions of the world. And we can see that these proportions stay at around 80 to 90%. So this is a very large number of wild plants that actually require pollination in order to be, to be able to reproduce and maintain their populations. We can also think about this in a very financial and hard way. Um, and actually today we have many studies that have started to evaluate the value of the service of pollination that pollinators provide. And today the value of pollination at the global scale goes, it's between 200 and $600 billion per year. This is a gigantic amount of money and a financial um, value that pollinators are contributing to our global economies. However, I don't like to think too much about, you know, just the money part of pollinators because I think that pollinators have a lot of other types of values that we need to realize as well. One of them is that pollinators contribute to our nutrition. You know, as I was showing in the, in the previous slides, um, we are producing more and more crops that actually depend on pollinators. And this is good, you know, it's good that we're producing, diversifying our crops uh, and having a better nutrition. And so pollinators are central to uh, our ability to feed ourselves in a very diverse way. Pollinators also, however, contribute to other uh, types of um, services, we can say. Um, and pollinators actually have a cultural value. So when we think about pollinators, we shouldn't be just thinking about food and, and, and money, you know, what this contributes to our economies, but pollinators are also you know, related to our lives. Many regions of the world have very specific connections and, and traditional practices that are directly associated to pollinators. As we see in this figure here uh, in China, where we have traditional ways of uh, managing and, um, and collecting honey, from these wild hives in caves. We have regions in Central America where uh, bees are directly associated to uh, gods and, and um, play an important role in the fecundity of the world. And also, you know, in our societies, we have a value that we're starting, even, you know, as is shown in this meeting, we're starting to associate with pollinators. We relate to these pollinators and we have links, personal links that make our lives better just because these pollinators are around. So now, you know, maybe at this point I could make some sort of point about, you know, the need uh, of maybe doing something to protect pollinators, not just to protect them, but also to help ourselves um, and then survive and, and maintain our, our quality of life. And so how can we do that? And I feel that today in this, in, you know, in this, um, this meeting today, there will be a lot of very specific things that will be communicated on what exactly you can do if we want to protect pollinators, support pollinators, what we can plant, how you can do that. But I think that more generally, there are several things that we can do and that I think that this is exactly what we're doing right now. So I'm really happy that this is happening. On the one hand, we need to actually continue to try to learn more about pollinators. As I was saying before, you know, pollinators, we don't know really very well um, exactly what the surveys are showing at the general scales because there aren't many surveys that have been done and we need to be able to understand better, you know, what pollinators are, what they do, what their ecology is and their evolution is so that we are able to protect them better. So we need to be able to continue supporting research on pollinators. On the other hand, we need to continue to educate ourselves and others on pollinators and why they are important to our ecosystems. And I feel that by doing these two things and taking the information that comes from the research and understanding that information, then we can use that knowledge to go and do things in the world. 
make decisions and try to recreate habit that, that will actually support all pollinators. And so I will stop here. I probably went over, over time. I don't know, I tend to talk too much, but um, this is my last slide. And so I thank you all um, you know, for listening. And um, yeah, I'll take any questions if there is time. And Thank you so much, Anahi. We're gonna do questions at the end. So everybody hold on to your questions. Um, and our next speaker then is Naomi Edelson. Hi, everybody. Uh, thank you for uh, joining us tonight. And I'm going to talk about a few things. I have a lot of slides, but I'm going to run through them very fast. And it's being recorded, so you can see them again. But let me do the hardest part, which is the share screen. And um, as was said, I am with the National Wildlife Federation, but I live in Tacoma Park. And I am going to talk about uh, a few different things, including an, a project we're working on locally called Caring for Sligo Creek. So I'm going to talk about, I'm going to build off that wonderful introduction, which really laid the case, and talk about how to, about na planting native plants at your home to help people and wildlife. We've been doing that with the National Wildlife Federation for a long time, for decades, and uh, encouraging people to plant uh, create wildlife habitat where they live, work, learn, play, and worship. And people love to garden. 90 million people in this country garden. And we know, as was pointed out, monarch decline, they're really, they're probably gonna get listed as endangered all over the whole country. They're in trouble and that their numbers are really low in Mexico where they migrate to. And we can attribute it to primarily the loss of milkweed, but other things including the need for nectar plants as well. But it's not just the monarchs, it's a big wildlife crisis in our whole country, North America, worldwide, and we've seen it with birds. We've lost 2.9 billion birds since 1970, including one of our favorites, the Eastern, this is a picture of an Eastern meadowlark, there's a Western meadowlark, but there are so many birds we have actually lost. But it's uh, there's many others. There's amphibians, there's reptiles, there's mammals, there's all kinds of species. And in fact, uh, we've identified more than 12,000 species in this country alone in need of conservation attention. And that's really probably not right, the right number. That's a low number. And that's the bill that I work on in Congress, Recovering America's Wildlife Act, which Congressman Raskin and Congressman Brown and others in the country are co-sponsors of which I'm not gonna talk about tonight, but we know there's a real wildlife crisis overall. It's not just pollinators. We're really doing a lot of things to habitat that we are gonna hurt people and wildlife. And if you watch Doug Tallamy's presentation, the next bunch of slides are gonna be related to his talk. And I've gotten to know him quite well. He's a partner of ours at the National Wildlife Federation. And he's really made the case that we have lost so much of our natural world and we can't rely just on those public lands to help save people and wildlife, that we need to recreate habitat on our own properties and that we need to build functioning ecosystems at home. And of course, most of us don't have a lawn like this, but we have some kind of a lawn, many of us do. And the question is, what can we do? Can we use those lawns to actually support life? Right now we have these biological deserts if we have a lawn. They might look beautiful manicured green that we've been trained to love, but they do not support life at all. Very, very few species actually use a lawn. So, and if we can change how we use our landscapes, we can also sequester carbon, obviously for climate change, a key piece. Well, as we talked about support pollinators and as uh, Mayor Kate talked about manage water, which is a big issue in this region under climate change with more water, more intensity, look what we had today, <laughs> more intensity and more frequency than what we had before. My son can play baseball tonight. Never mind the pollinators. What about the baseball? And uh, so Doug Tallamy has done a great job of becoming an ambassador for this cause and he has a beautiful book about it and many others. And we have, again, embraced his work to this idea that we can do something at home to uh, 
build on what we've done in our public lands and have a partnership to really restore our natural world. And wildlife needs four basic things to survive, food, water, cover, and places to raise young. But the predominant issue is the food. And we know that, that we can recreate habitat by planting native plants because they are the foundation for all the other species in urban, rural, and suburban communities. And people think of food for wildlife as putting out a bird feeder. And I know there's been all this stuff going around about take your bird feeders down. Well, I have to tell you something right now because of the disease that's been going around. Bird feeders don't really help birds. I mean, it's wonderful that people do it, but it's more for our enjoyment. The real food for birds is creating those native plants that uh, are, are important for the insects that co-evolved with them. And in fact, these native plants um, are host to caterpillars of which caterpillars are so important to birds. And it turns out that most birds and most other wildlife actually rely on caterpillars, which of course turn into butterflies and moths, but that they need this as their primary protein. These caterpillars are critical. And they, you know, a uh, chickadee needs up to 9,000 caterpillars in just a three week period to raise their young. It's unbelievable how much they need. And that these native plants, these some, in, some caterpillars only exist on one kind of native plant. And some lists might exist, I might use a variety of them, but it's apt, they do not survive on plants that aren't from our area. And some of the work that's been done to show this. Here's an example. Uh, you can see the difference for white oak. They have 233 caterpillars were found on this particular day in 15 species. But Bradford pear, which actually, uh, when I lived in Arlington, Virginia, they planted throughout the city in Tacoma Park. We don't have Bradford pear planted as a major tree. But look at that. They found one caterpillar and only one species. This is true for all different kinds of native trees and all different kinds of perennial uh, flowering plants. And Doug Tallamy did a study which showed which native plants, which native plants actually produce the most caterpillars or most ho the host with the most. And it turns out oak are one of the most important. So uh, what I would recommend to the city of Tacoma Park, for example, is chestnut oak is a smaller tree that could go in, on public on streets as sidewalk areas that really would actually help with caterpillars, which will become the butterflies and moths. And then uh, here's a beautiful oak that won't fit on a sidewalk. Oops. Uh, we created a tool called the Native Plant Finder, which I'll put in, which actually helps you put in your zip code and tells you the best native plants to based on which are host for um, butterflies and moths and caterpillars. And you can have beautiful trees. Dogwood is a beautiful tree, native tree to put in your yard. Here's another example of good plants for the uh, Mid-Atlantic, golden rotted aster. I didn't get signed up for the native plant um, tour, uh, but my yard is full of golden rods and asters and black-eyed Susans. It looks like people say, oh, it looks like wilderness. <laughs> and, it look, and it buzzes. Let me tell you, there are so many bees who use the plants in my yard. So we know native plants are better. And that if we actually all do this together, collectively, we can make a big difference for people in wildlife. Here's the native plant finder. Sorry, this got put in the wrong order. And so we started a program called Sacred Grounds, working with the faith community and specifically got a grant from the Chesapeake Bay Trust to care for Sligo Creek, which which flows into the Anacostia River, one of the most troubled rivers in the country. A lot of public effort has gone into cleaning up this beautiful river, which flows into the Chesapeake Bay. So here's our beautiful Sligo Creek in Tacoma Park. I love it. I just came from biking on it. And here's what it looks like because of climate change. This was taken this past year, really phenomenal, raging water flooding through it, causing terrific erosion, and bringing all the pollution from the lawns in our area, all the chemical fertilizers, all the pesticides and so on that people have been putting with throughout our region. 
And it turns out that native plants typically, not always, have longer root systems. So they actually slow the flow of the water. So not only are they important for our host caterpillars, which turn into pollinators, but also because they slow the flow. And so this project, Caring for Sligo Creek, is about putting in native plants at home. And we're working with five congregations to be ambassadors. Our goal is 100 homes to plant native plants and to certify as wildlife habitat and to take advantage of the Montgomery County's Rainscapes Application Program. And we worked with every congregation to do a webinar. We talked about it as Caring for Creation at Home. And here's St. Michael Parish in Silver Spring, right by Whole Foods, which flows right into the Silver, uh, to uh, Sligo Creek downhill. And then we also did it in Spanish. That's a half Spanish speaking population. And you'll see Kit Gage with Friends of Sligo Creek. And we did walking tours, beautiful asters in somebody's yard. We, and then this, importantly, we did something called the Native Plant Giveaway, where we actually gave away up to 2,000 native plants between here and the Anacostia area of DC. And we tied it to Mother's Day and caring for Mother's Earth. Here's another beautiful aster picture with a, a butterfly right on it. And we asked people to pledge to plant natives. And I will send you a note about how you can be part of this. And we worked with a congregation in Tacoma Park. Here's Tacoma Park Presbyterian Church. And good old Tacoma Park, look at that. There was a line of people trying to get the native plants. It was excellent. We also had that with Kent Mill Synagogue up at the top. They did, they also had a lot of people come, which is great. Is Roger Griffiths, you might know him. Uh, we had, there's a great team of uh, high school Blair students who help and come to your yard and with doing a uh, planting natives and clearing out your weeds. Count, County Executive Mark Elrich pledged to plant native, as did Mayor uh, Kate Stewart. She came to the pickup and here she is. And we, Jamie Raskin got some plants. We delivered them right to his home to help him. We know he loves Sligo Creek. And uh, I'll share this with you later. Here's some of the things we gave out and my own home, what, I, what is coming to my home with milkweed. And we know people in this area care a lot and we can really make a difference together by planting native plants and helping our pollinators and all of our wildlife. And so we ask you to join us to make sure we have a healthy creek for our wildlife and our young people. And that's it. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Naomi. Um, I love the idea of the, our collective efforts, which is what we're all doing here. Um, next is Lauren Wheeler. Lauren. Hello, everybody, and thank you for the invitation. Um, let me just pull up the PowerPoint. Here we go. And I'm learning so much great information. So thank you all previous pre presenters. Um, let's see here. Oh, here we go. All right. So I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, specifically about the, uh, landscape design and how you think about landscape design as related to enhancing um, your, your landscapes, no matter what their size is, for uh, pollinators. And um, I can't speak highly enough of Doug Talmy's book uh, because it's, it's a very hands-on book and particularly the second book that he just came out with also really um, provides a lot of information. Um, one of the things that we believe in our firm and how I think is that what we're really doing is we're thinking about regenerative design and making sure that whatever we're doing in our landscapes um, is thinking about how do you build up for the, the, the theory is that how do you build up so that it's a restoring landscape, it's a functioning landscape, it's one that produces its own materials and its own viability and its own reproduction. Um, these are all photographs of sites that uh, of um, uh, different creatures in our, our landscapes that we've designed. And I'm going to put a big shout out to the Chelone on the left hand side. Um, uh, Lauren Hubbard might be more qualified to speak to this than I am, but I believe it's one of the host plants for the Baltimore checker spot, which I understand to be um, endangered and it is a local native butterfly, and these are phenomenal plants. 
And then whenever we're designing, we're always thinking about designing in totality with all of the natural systems around there. So combinations of plants, combinations of fruit, making sure you have water on site, making sure you have mud on site, because a lot of um, making sure you have dry spa spaces, dust baths, that sort of thing in your designs. And that's part of the practice of having a functional landscape. A functional landscape is a landscape that's uh, serving multiple purposes, but first and foremost, at least from our perspective, is it's providing native habitat for as many different kinds of fauna and that we're trying to also, generally speaking, adhere to actual plant community, uh, naturally found plant communities and how those are put together. So this is a great uh, design of a residential landscape, for example, where you have a series of um, uh, native grasses that are going and you have a lot of flowering plants. And then on the right, one of my all time favorite plants, which is called the cup plant. And that actually holds water in the little cups of those large leaves, which enable not just birds to come in and feed off the water, but also um, butterflies and other sorts of insects. This was designed by my colleague, Susan Abraham. Claudia West, who recently um, wrote a book with Thomas Rainier, uh, speaks a lot about having the really important thought of having many, many layers in how you design. So in a very general sense, you wanna have uh, trees, uh, shade trees, understory trees, reference the oak trees, the dogwoods that have already been referred to. You definitely want to have um, shrub layers at different heights all throughout and that you're, we like to uh, draw attention to the human eye as well. So we think of a seasonal theme layer and then very importantly at the ground layer, not just having mulch, but actually having ground plants that will provide coverage for insects that are walking or through, um, at the ground le level, et cetera. And always thinking about planting in combination. So there was a big trend in landscape design a couple of years ago where you just plant these large masses. I'm not opposed to that, but think about how you plant in combination with other plants because that's going to be super important in terms of having strategized um, blooming times and um, the plants and fruit are an important process of when, the, you know, if you think about it again, um, like skunk cabbage is one of the first things that comes out and that uh, attracts a specific kind of pollinator to the skunk cabbage flower. So the, each one of these are kind of successional and provide for different pollinators when they're in bloom. Plant densely, plant deep plugs if you can, strategize blooming and growth rates, and think about immediate cover. Because if you don't plant really densely, and when I say densely, and I think Lauren Hubbard is going to go over this, I mean very densely, because you don't want weed growth to come up, which are weeds tend to be non natives, which do not support our native populations. I tend to um, like to create little vignettes of landscapes. So in this case, I call these my kickables. And these are, um, you could also put in path rush or something on this sort of, uh, this sort of planting right here where plants that actually kind of thrive, if you put next, them next to walkways, actually do very well with the disturbance. Uh, think of yourself as a deer walking through the woods. And I wanted to point out a little bit in the difference of the trends that have been going on. Um, so on the left is a garden that we planted in 2005. This was all grass when we planted it. And then um, you can see how we've almost kind of created the design on the left where we have Rebecca and then we have Panicums and then we have um, Eupatorium or Black Eyed Susan, Switchgrass and Joe Pieweed. And it's kind of very distinct in terms of how it's lined up. And this was remarkable in 2005. Girl Scouts and Boy Scouts troops throughout Mount Vernon would come to see the number of pollinators that were on this in this lawn compared to all the other lawns that you see around here. Now, currently we're planting in this matrix of, of native plants so that we're actually looking at 
uh, reference landscapes close by to see how what what can we do in terms of getting these very complex matrices of plants and you see it has a little bit more wild feel to it but it is the bomb in terms of attracting pollinators because there's all these different levels to it there's always something in bloom it's a very very strong it's replicating nature so this, you might hear my kids in the background because they're home. Uh, so if you, if, if it, I'll try and hurry up so we don't get disturbed by them. Um, think about connectivity and how you're, you, we've already been referred to pollinator, you know, highways or the, all that sort of stuff. And I just want to put a call out to communities specifically like, um, you know, Washington DC or Tacoma Park who's put limitations on what sort of plants that you can plant. But when you think about community design, you're thinking about how do you, could this community specifically wanted to integrate tall prairie grasses within the, all the backyards of the homes in this particular community. And that helps fauna and pollinators to transition into suburban areas easily. This was a municipal park we did in, um, in Gaithersburg and the entire hillside, they wanted us initially to kind of like put in roses and hydrangeas, which are fine, but most hydrangeas are not in fact native. But instead what we did is we went out, we found a reference landscape and we pulled from the reference landscape um, close by within like five miles of the same sort of cultural conditions. And we planted out what we call horticultural hills. So it was supposed to be for gardeners to learn what the native plants were. And then I would just throw, throw out like when you're thinking about plants, also think about the soils. So we use a lot of found wood as um, ways to recapture um, uh, good soil bi biology. If you have good soil biology, you're going to have great and much better plants um, uh, regardless. That's horticulture hill. Bioretention or rain gardens equals pollinator gardens. This is one of the ones that we did at Constitution Gardens. It's all pollinators. I mean, it's all native plants in here, these beautiful combinations. And within three weeks of plantings, this is the sort of uh, photographs that we were taking um, at that site. Residential at the residential landscape. Um, it's super important that we were that this is um, uh, you know off the grid home, and we planted out a rain garden there. And within that, within a matter of again a month or so, we were able to document all these pollinators that were actually. Uh, I'm not so sure the toad is a po pollinator, but all the others we were able to document on site. And then to remember that it's super important that no matter what sort of space you have, you can still plant fully and richly with native plants to promote pollinators. It doesn't matter. The first time I put in a purple cone flower, echinacea on a hillside, I put in four plants and literally within like an hour, I had, um, I had gold finches on it and all kinds of um, butterflies. It was really quite surprising. And then again, when you're looking at this is that even one container can provide so much for your pollinators. If you have even a window box outside of your home, you can put in uh, native plants that are floriferous and will provide for pollinators. So one of my favorite things that I typically do in the upper left-hand corner is I love to teach children how to pet bumblebees. And so when we're doing community planting days, I usually take the time to make sure that our next generation are not afraid of insects, are not afraid of, um, of all those things out there that buzz or um, fly. And so I spend a lot of time thinking about how how to do that. And one of the ways is to teach them how to pet bumblebees. So thank you all very much. And um, I'll pass it on to Lauren Hubbard. Thank you, Lauren, so much. And um, I will just, in the, in a, just let Lauren keep going. Lauren, you ready? Yeah, I'm going to pull up Great. my, share my screen now. Um, 
Let's see. Let me just move this down a little bit here. Make sure it's in the right place. Yes. Okay. Okay. Here we go. So thank you. I'm so I'm following on the heels of Lauren Wheeler, who is has an amazing, uh, you know, record of uh, accomplishments in this field. I'm a relative newbie to this, but um, but I hope I can make a case that each one of you can do this at your home. It's not that hard, and Lauren Wheeler's uh, description is a beautiful, you know, beautiful a holistic approach which probably will feel a bit overwhelming to most of us to try to hold all of that in our minds and think about how to do this. But you, you don't have to be all in at the first go. Like she said, a pot with some plants is a great way to start. So I'm gonna to try to give you some practical tips on how to actually do this at your house. Um, so step one, get your, pick your site. You have some place that you'd like to put a pollinator garden in. Um, as has been discussed, you can often catch some storm water doing these projects, but even if it's just replacing some turf, that's wonderful because turf isn't particularly helpful to the environment as has also been discussed. This was a project that I was part of up in New York where we transitioned a little pocket park into a pollinator garden. And it was a lot of volunteer effort, um, very, very low budget, basically no money. <laughs> so a lot of volunteers and a lot of donated materials um, this was the kids putting out the cardboard and mulch over the turf. So literally that's how you get started. Just put down some, take the, take the tape and the, you know, plastic junk off the cardboard, put it right over the turf and layer some mulch on top a couple inches just to hold the, really it's just holding the cardboard down. What you're doing here is you're blocking the weeds. You're covering everything up and you're creating a clean slate for planting because weeds are the problem. You don't remove any of this when it's time to plant. You actually just plant right into it. Um, you can <clears throat> let it sit. So this was actually put down in the fall and sat over the winter and then we planted in the spring. But you can do this. You could do this now and then plant in the fall. That's fine too. You don't really want to plant in the heat of the summer though because that's really tough on the plants to try to survive all that heat. So you're going to have a better success if you try to do this at a different time of year when weather's a little... Um, easier on the plants. You will have to be weeding and watering that first year. You know, keep on those weeds, do not let them get a hold. That's usually how people fail is they kind of, you know, get distracted and then they don't get on the weeds. And then next thing you know, they've got this big weedy mess and they have to start over. So weed early and often. Um, at that same site, this is what it looked like at year one. Uh, yes, Lauren Wheeler's right, plant densely. This is not densely planted because again, low budget. We did what we could based on, you know, getting donated plants and people, whatever they had in their yards and that kind of thing. Um, so we had to go in and add as, as the project moved along. Um, and we had to weed a lot and there was a lot of watering because the ground wasn't very well covered. You can see a lot of mulch here. So lots of weeding, watering, and, and adjusting in your one. If you plant denser using plugs, um, that uh, usually comes in a big tray with like 30 or 50 smaller plants, but you can compare the price. You can get, you can get a $2 plant, 50 of them, when you do a tray of plugs versus probably a $7 quart. So you get a lot more plants for your dollar if you go plugs. All right, so first year, here's year three. So pretty amazing, right? You went from this kind of weedy lawn to then you have the, uh, the dirt phase. <laughs> and now you have this amazing garden that went from, you know, not much to having hummingbirds visit it. So how cool is that? And also much lower maintenance at this point. Not a whole lot has to be done. Basically uh, annual um, a trim down to, to just cut it down and you can leave the plants up all the way through the winter. Don't cut down until late winter, early spring. Actually, this is another view of that garden in the spring. So really beautiful, you know, lots of different palettes. This wasn't super complicated, um, just a lot of donated stuff. Um, so you're gonna trim it down in the late spring, I'm sorry, late winter, early spring, and you're actually gonna leave four to six inches of the stalk standing because a lot of insects actually overwinter and live in those hollow stems of the native plants. A lot of native plants have hollow stems. So the insects are hanging out down in there 
going through the winter and even actually well through the year. When you leave those stalks up, um, don't worry because as soon as the plants start growing pretty soon, you won't even see them anymore. They'll just be covered up by new growth. Also leave your leaves. So if you have your leaves fall on your property, if you rake them all up and put them in a bag and carry that back to the curb, you just took the, uh, the um, chrysalises of this beautiful fertility butterfly to the curb. You took your butterflies out and put them on the curb. You have to leave the leaves because that's where these butterflies overwinter. So among other insects. So keep the leaves and use it as mulch. And you should only mulch once that first time when you first prepare your soil. So how about a few plant selection uh, considerations? You got to know where you live. We are in the Piedmont region of Maryland. Um, at least try to pick plants native to Maryland. And to get a little more focused in, most of most folks on this call, I was kind of looking at where people were from. Most of you are in the Piedmont, um, and you want to, you know, note whether you're a lot of sun, a lot of shade, wet and dry, those kinds of general conditions. Uh, your soil conditions are can be very important. Some plants are more sensitive to that than others. So you want to take note. Usually we tend to be kind of on the clay end of things. Up in New York, I was more leaning towards sand. I was out on Long Island with sandy loam. And then of course, we all have deer. This is Dottie. She lived in my neighborhood. She was raised by a neighbor. She would have two to three babies every year. I have a lot of deer and I have no fencing. So if I don't plant uh, natives that are deer resistant, I have nothing because they eat them all. So pick your plants according to deer resistance. And there are quite a few plants that you can select and also creating a diverse planting palette helps to deter the deer because it, it's hard work for them to have to like tease out which ones they can eat. Um, as uh, Lauren Wheeler mentioned, uh, planting densely will help combat the weeds. So that's a thing and having that nice ground layer, there are some really great native ground covers that will stay evergreen through the winter and help combat the weeds and trying to make it attractive so that all your neighbors wanna do this too. All right, so here's a, a project that I did to illustrate a couple things. One is that you can have any kind of style, right? You, you can plant a formal style like this, which was part of an HOA where the rest of the area was formal-ish. So we try to kind of evoke that formal style. This is all native plants. I'm also pointing out the, the, the planting uh, spacing. So pay really good attention, especially when you're planting trees and shrubs, because you wanna look at how big they'll be when they're fully mature. I can't tell you how many trees I've had to cut down because they were four inches from the house. It's a very sad day when the tree has to come down because the first person who put it in was like, it can't possibly get that big. And you know, 30 years later, there you are. So pay attention to that. With the other herbaceous plants, you can often plant them denser than what their specifications call for and then edit them out, remove a few later on and give them to your friends and neighbors. And then you're on the butterfly bandwagon because you're sharing plants. Um, think about, this has been mentioned, multi-season interest, having a long bloom season, right? So you're filling that space and, and providing food for the uh, pollinators for a long time. And there's plants that can go from, you know, all the way from April into November. Um, and then you can have evergreen interest in the winter with some evergreen shrubs or ground covers and things like that. All of those things are possible. Um, paying attention to height and width of the maturity. I talked about that a little bit already. And then I'm going to say, here's this last sentence down here is perhaps the most important. We're throwing all this information at you and you're perhaps throwing your arms up in the air and going, oh my gosh, this is just way too complicated. I can't do this. Forget it all. Just plant something. Plant some native plants, get started, adjust them later. Don't worry about it too much. It'll all be good and you will have pollinators. This has been talked about already, so I'll skip right by real quick, but again, emphasizing what you plant does kind of matter. So at least throw a goldenrod in there because they host so many um, insects and there's a lot of different goldenrod species that can grow in shade and sun and all kinds of conditions. So try to get a goldenrod if you happen to have the right kind of trees. Um, I found two of these beautiful lunamas this spring when I was out pulling garlic mustard. So I'm pulling out the invasives. And I come across these newly pupated luna moths because I have actually got on my property black walnut, butternut, and wild cherries. So three different species that might host this guy. Um, I'm lucky that way. 
Let me touch briefly on this topic, cultivars. This comes up a lot. So what are they? So when you have a native plant or any plant really, any species, the type that you find out in the wild is referred to as the straight species. When you start breeding it and picking out very specific uh, traits, um, you call it a cultivar. It's been bred and selected. When you do that, you do reduce the genetic diversity of that particular line of plants, right? So if you want to promote the most genetic diversity, you need to use straight species. Sometimes you might want a cultivar because the only native plant you know, that you can use on your property, some shrub is too tall. So you need it to be a little shorter or something. And that's okay. Use the cultivars if that's what you need to do. But I'm gonna encourage you to try to use straight species as much as possible. A few cultivars that you might want to avoid are those that change the leaf color and those that change the flower shape because those particular traits have been shown to uh, prohibit or limit the way that insects can actually access the plant as a resource. The leaf color is changing the chemistry of the leaf and therefore making it less palatable to the insects and changing flower shape, of course, impacts the ability of the insects to interact with the flower. And it's, that's been a tightly co-evolving um, thing, how, how an insect, you've know, probably seen these things where the bees, they go in and they, they go into a flower tube or something in a certain way and how their body interacts with the flower or their tongue length turns out to be really important, how they can reach into the floral tube to connect with the nectar. So avoid those changes. Where to get plants? It's always a big question too, and a challenging one. And this is something that would be um, great if we, could, if we could make this better for everybody. But the best choice is to get those that are locally sourced and grown. Those are locally ecotype plants. In order to go collect seed from parks and things like that, you need special permits. You are not allowed to just go out there and do this yourself, but there are people who are all, there are uh, organizations, Chesapeake natives and our Sangas particularly who are, these are not-for-profit not organizations. They get the proper permits, they collect seed, they grow it up and they sell it back to the public. So you can get your native plants that way. That's my top choice for natives. If uh, you can join the Wild Ones, this is an organization that promotes using natives in landscaping. We have a local chapter. Um, I see Marnie Bruce on the call. She's one of the leaders of that group. A um, number of people in that group have a lot of local ecotype plants and they share them in the plant swap. So you can get free plants that way. Or you can grow your own once you have a few and you can collect seed and then grow them out. I do a lot of that myself. That's what's going on down here in these lower pots. Um, when you go to your local nursery, because maybe these are all just not within your um, ability to, to access for one reason or another, uh, ask for straight species. They probably won't have them because most of the time your local nursery is going to have uh, cultivars, but let's start asking and maybe they'll start offering them. Avoid plants treated with neonicotinoids. These are referred to often as neonics. There is a chemical that you know impacts uh, insects, so you don't wanna be doing that. And be careful because sometimes when you go to a local nursery and they'll say, oh, well, here's our native section. And then you look at it, actually the plants they have there might be native to like California, but not Maryland. So you have to be a little careful about that when, when you go to regular nurseries because they might not be as aware of what native really means to most of us. Um, but if you go to Chesapeake Natives or Sanga, you're getting things that are really native to our region. And even though Ursang is located in Virginia, it's really close enough in my opinion. Mail order is also another option with the same caveats as the local nursery, more or less. All right, some resources. A number of these have already been mentioned, including Doug Ptolemy's books, very accessible to the public. Um, there's books on pollinators. This uh, pamphlet or booklet really here, the native plants and for wildlife habitat, habitat and conservation landscaping is a really useful resource. If you join the wild ones, they send you a copy. Merritt Marnie can um, confirm that for me, but it's also available as an online um, tool. So you can search in there and that's gonna quickly narrow you down in terms of nativeness to our region. Uh, get familiar with your invasive plants and manage those. That's really the first step in this whole process is kind of cleaning up your space and making sure that you're under control there. And access the rainscapes. 
uh, resources, even if you can't apply to the rebate because you live in Tacoma Park and they don't qualify, you can still access their website, which actually has a ton of information and lots of great resources, including plant lists for deer resistance, sun, sunny sites, shady sites, all kinds of useful guides on designing, et cetera. So go for that. Um, the, I list this one here because I'm a master gardener, um, but I will tell you that website's been all changed up. So at this point, you're just gonna have to um, search their site for native plants. And I think that might get you somewhere. And let's see, a couple of upcoming events. If you are interested in attending some of these, you can email me and I'll send you a link to sign up because they're from various organizations that I work for, but there's a there's a invasive vine removal and native garden maintenance program coming up this weekend, as well as a webinar that's sort of an advanced topics thing, diving into some of this a bit more. Um, we have another invasive uh, tree and shrub removal and maintenance event coming up in July. Um, some more Q&A sessions, uh, intro sessions, all kinds of stuff going on. So if you want anything, any, know more about any of this, please email me. Um, here's my email address and I'll put it in the chat box as well. This is one of the over 30 box turtles that lives on my property that I have found. You can tell because they each have a unique set of spots on their backs. They're mostly females coming out to lay their eggs right about now, actually in June, this is when we see them. So at this point I'm gardening for the turtles. And with that, I will stop sharing and I guess we get to the Q and A, but I do wanna stop one, one last moment and just really thank Mayor Stewart for her leadership. That's an amazing thing to have your elected official really leading on this. So I wanna just a special shout out for that. Thank you very much for that. Thank you, Lauren. And thank you all. That was so incredible. All of your presentations, so inspiring. And thank you for your time and knowledge and helping us to understand why this is so vital now and encouraging us to use uh, native, more native plants. Before we open it to q and I just wanted to um, say one thing, now that you might be inspired to start or add native plants to your yard or balcony or front step, I wanna mention a project called Rewild Montgomery, which aims to increase awareness of the value of native plants and provide education and resources to help you implement native mm -hmm. plantings. And you can register your home with them with the goal, there's a goal to reach 2021 new or expanded native species plantings in Montgomery County by the end of 2021. The link to that is in the chat. If you've already planted natives or when you do, you can just get on the website and add your name and hopefully we will get to 2021 by the end of the year. And now let's um, open it up to questions. There were a few in the chat. Um, one I know was about uh, using native mulch. Somebody would like to address that. I'm happy to speak on that just briefly. Um, I actually love to use whatever's on your property. So if you happen to have a lot of pine needles or if you happen to have a lot of leaves or if you happen to have had a tree cut down and had it chipped, you know, use, use what's on your land, if you can, or nearby. Um, I know Marnie, she goes out and collects pine needles from her neighborhood. She's laughing, yeah. <laughs> so, you know, you don't have to go out and buy a bunch of stuff and have a bunch of plastic bags and all that mess. If you can use what's available to you, that's a great way to do it. Um, it's maybe not the most, uh, it doesn't always promote the fastest growth of plants to do those kinds of things but it is more sustainable in the long run. And I'm generally willing to wait a little bit to make it work out. Great, uh, thank you. There was another question on whether chicory and queen ants lace are good pollinators. Anybody have? That was my question. They're certainly hardy and disease resistant and drought resistant. Mm -hmm. No? Right. Any takers? No? Okay. Um, other questions anyone have? So Please. those, uh, just, just one thing about those plants. Those are plants that are not native to North America. They are, they are present here. You know, they are naturalized, uh, but they are not native. 
And, and even though they may or not be invasive in you know, the way that we classify them, it's better to try to benefit maybe other types of plants that may be hardy enough, but that are actually native to here. So if, you know, if you had a piece of land, I would say, and you were to choose what to plant, maybe plant something else, um, yeah, even though they are hardy. Right, I'm gonna, I'm gonna jump in on that theme and this comes up a number, I've had this come up many sure. times that uh, butterfly bush, right? So butterfly bush, yeah, yeah, tons of butterflies will be attracted to it, but it's not a native plant. And in fact, is proving to be invasive a little bit. It's starting to, you know, get out into mm -hmm. the wilderness. So mm -hmm. it's really critical to use natives. Okay, Marnie, do you have a hand up? Yes, I, uh, I just had a comment in uh, several of the presentations, there were the pictures of bee houses. And I would just like to, to point out that it's not a good idea to, to put up bee houses. You are, you are just oh, setting them up for predators. It's better to create the habitat where you'll have bees all over your property and not one place where all the, the wasps or the birds or whatever can go and get the young bees. Thanks. Um, there was another question that just came in about pine chat that has, has lots of ticks and how do you handle that? Because ticks carry bad diseases for humans. Anyone can address that? I'm, I'm going to admit that I don't know exactly what prime shat is. Is that the needles or wood or something? But uh, I think this goes back to the What's broader. Chat? What's the, chat? Yeah, I don't know. But the broader <laughs> problem of, <laughs> of a balanced ecosystem, you know, that we're, we're so out of balance that we end up with situations where, like, if you have the wrong kinds of plants and you, you're not attracting the right kinds of birds that eat the ticks, that kind of, that kind of whole balance situation. Um, if you spray, you're killing certain things that are gonna impact other things. So it's not easy. We live in suburban situations that are gonna be very difficult to, to create a really balanced system, but that's what we're talking about here really is trying to bring some of that back. Hopefully, um, maybe Anhi has a, you know, as the entomology person might be able to <laughs> elaborate on that better than I can. Oh, the needles. Okay. I see somebody saying it's the needles. Um, I haven't had that particular problem in my property so much, but. Anyway. Yeah, I, uh, so I just, just two things and kind of going with what Lauren was saying. I feel that uh, we tend to try to find the one solution that will fix it all. And I think that an important thing is that we need to try to move away from that mindset, um, which is what kind of, I think what Lauren is trying to say too, is that, um, and you know, also what uh, Marnie, I think was mentioning about the, the B hotels and all that, is that there is no one thing that will fix it. And uh, what we try to, we need to try to do is to provide a lot of different things that will bring that habitat back to its balance. And so it may be a bad idea to create a gigantic wall with only bee, bee hotels in the same way that it may be a bad idea to just put pine needles everywhere or, you know, or whatever else, right? And so, but having a little bit, bit of that and a little bit of that and just like, lots of patches of a lot of different habitats is really key because that's really what brings that balance back on the topic of the pine needles i've never heard anything like that and i i haven't had that experience uh in our department there is a person that is specialized on ticks um and i've never heard that that was an issue um 
it seems that it's mostly grassy areas and you know other types of habitats but not pine needles so i don't i don't know i haven't heard that okay thank you um there's another question um any suggestions for understory oh lauren did you want to say something yeah so um i'm going to chime in here on a couple of little different uh topics first thing i would say is that um i'm not a big fan of using straight chippers to create mulch from wood or branches unless you plan on composting them um, off to the side of your garden because it's my understanding that the way that that decomp that the wood material decomposes it actually steals nitrogen from the ground so if you use a quickly chipped wood chips or anything else like that in your garden unless you're using it for paths for where you can walk on it's not actually good for plants on the other hand, it's fabulous if you want to speed up the process of using your leaves from your yard and putting them in a chipper and or even mowing over them with your electric mower, of course, or your hand powered mower, of course, three or four times to get them broken down into small pieces. Leaf mulch appears to be the best thing in general because it's replicating natural systems by chipping them a couple of times, you're speeding up the decomposition and the way in which the leaves can break down and feed the soils. So that's my recommendation for uh, the best mulch that you can use in your property, particularly for those of you in Tacoma Park where you have plenty of trees where you can uh, compost. I used to live in Tacoma Park. Um, and I would say that I, I too have not heard anything about ticks being more prevalent on pine needles than any other kind of mulch. My anecdotal landscaping experience says that most, that we just don't know where ticks are going to be, particularly ones that carry the diseases now because it's where the deers walk <clears throat> and are frequent, frequenting where we see higher populations of ticks. Okay, back to the question about what are um, what are some plants that do well in evergreen native plants that do well in shade. Ilex glabra or inkberry are really excellent plants for shade and evergreen. Um, we I do uh, perhaps to take a slight deviation from what Lauren Hubbard was saying. I have a very strong feeling about not using cultivars that have different flower shape or different foliage color or even different flower color, okay? Though I understand, and Anahi, if that's, uh, you may have this research more readily available when the research was done um, on flocks, uh, our native occurring flocks, so it didn't matter if the, uh, the flower color was white light pink or blue, they all got the same number of pollinators depending, but that's naturally occurring. So there is the opportunity to use what's called a variety, which is a naturally occurring um, change. It may not be as good as a straight species. This all goes to say one of my favorite variety of plants, and somebody else may correct me on this, is a viburnum winterter, which was a variety I understand that was created at Mount or found and maybe Winterter Gardens. And that's a semi evergreen plant that is a great viburnum, phenomenal pollinator, great fruiting bodies. Um, what were some of the other plant questions there on that question? Wait, can you repeat that viburnum? Which Vi Vi viburnum Winterter, W I N T E R T H U R. Um, but does somebody else know if that? I mean, somebody else can chime in. We're always learning something from each other all the time. So I never feel like um, if somebody comes in and says this is better to use or a better thing, then that's great. Um, or in the other part of that question was, are there uh, any suggestions for understory trees and shrubs that will grow in shade? Oh my gosh. So the definition of understory trees is that they grow under shade trees, okay? And so, all of our native trees basically are understory trees. They're either ecotone trees, which means they go on the, uh, grow on the edge of the woods, or they're actually designed to, or you know, been created to grow under story. So dogwoods are understory trees. Red buds are um, edge trees. The ones grow between um, amelanchier, which is serviceberry, which is a phenomenal plant, 
and you can get all different kinds of, well, you can get a number of different kinds of Emelanchia. So those are great. I'm a huge fan of, somebody help me out here, Musclewood is, Carpinus is a great um, understory tree. Really, really, really gorgeous bark, really gorgeous leaf structure. Um, there's a lot of large shrubs that will grow in, um, in uh, uh, really shady conditions. Clethro will grow in really shady conditions. Um, uh, uh, the list is kind of endless in terms of what you can uh, grow in um, shady conditions. Now, having said that, if you have deep shade, start with a small plant. Don't take a plant that's been grown in a, a full sun nursery pop it into deep shade and expect that it will do well for you in the future. It will not. Another phenomenal plant that does really great are both um, is our hydrangea arborescence. So the native hydrangea, you see that just walking, you know, along Sligo Creek, you can find that. Um, you see it along Rock Creek. Um, and some a lot of the carexes are evergreen. You have to check and see which carex are evergreen. So that's a ground layer that is a phenomenal um, uh, plant or semi evergreen. So those would be my suggestions, but the list is endless. <laughs> Thank you. There, there's a question about, does the garlic spray that kills chicks kill other insects? I know that might be for you. <laughs> Can you repeat the garlic spray? Does, the, does garlic spray that kills ticks kill other insects? I, I do not know that garlic spray killed ticks, but probably if it does, it probably kills also other insects. Uh, ticks and, and in, so ticks are not insects, but they are similar kind of, they have lots of similarities. And one of the things is that they have this um, hard protection that is called a nexoskeleton. And usually the things that work on animals that have an exoskeleton will work in other animals that have an exoskeleton. So because they share that, it probably works. But I didn't know that garlic spray works on ticks. <laughs> That's a good information. Well, anyone else want to chime in on that one? OK, um, another Send one. Send it to you. Go ahead. No, I was just saying, because ticks are a big deal. And uh, I think that, so we have a garlic spray we've tried, but my sister uses it regularly. You know, with Lyme disease, it really is a problem. So I'll send it to you and you can tell me what you know. <laughs> Does it stink like garlic? Yeah. Oh, good. <laughs> <laughs> okay, another question. I planted a butterfly bush last year thinking I was doing a good thing. I'm going to remove it from my property. Is it okay to give it to someone else or are they damaging enough that it's better to just compost it? You think a butterfly, butterfly bush, it's like going to the McDonald's versus going to the Tacoma Park farmer's market and getting really nutritious, good food that's been grown theoretically locally. So that's the difference. So if you didn't feed your child the McDonald's, and I have children and I feel it feed my children McDonald's, so I'm not pure, but, um, and then turned around and gave it to another child that was standing in line, it's your choice. Having said that, the most phenomenal plants you can plant in terms of like straight out effect, and again, other people can correct me on this, any of the milkweeds are great. So swamp milkweed, if you have some place that's kind of wet, um, common milkweed is great overall. Um, and I'm a huge fan of mountain of many of the mountain mints. So those are uh, some of the strong ones for me. I'm gonna I'm gonna jump in on the, the butterfly bush comment again and say get rid of don't don't share it. And I say that because I moved into my house four years ago and it had a number of butterfly bushes and barberry and a bunch of other stuff that I had to get rid of. But the I took the butterfly bush out first year and I put some raised bed vegetable gardens in my backyard. And for two years after that, I had butterfly bushes coming out of my vegetable garden, which was new soil over turf. So somehow those seeds 
got into my vegetable garden beds. I don't know how. So I'm concerned about this thing spreading into the woods. And I live up against Rock Creek Park, which is already full of a bunch of invasives. So I'm thinking, let's not add yet another load to that problem, you know, as a weed warrior, right? I do that volunteer thing too. So I'm, I'm saying no, no, no thank you to the butterfly bush. Um, you can compost it. Yeah, and also instead of the butterfly bush, plant some native honeysuckles that are lovely. And they also have that structure. Uh, they are really lovely. And they are not very hard to grow. You just need to protect them from the deer for a little bit because the deer really likes them. <laughs> Or you could, or you could throw in one of uh, the clethro that Lauren Wheeler was talking about, which is a fantastic late season pollinator shrub. Great. So there's another question: Is it any better to limit non-natives to containers so they cannot spread, or better just to get rid of them altogether? Um, I'm gonna, I'm gonna quote a little bit of Doug Ptolemy. So the research he's done has shown that if you have your yard filled with, if 70% if of the biomass in your yard is in native plant material, that is the tipping point in which you can produce enough caterpillars to support a flock of chickadees to continue to produce babies, right? That's the tipping point is that 70%. And chickadees are sort of like the lab rat for this study, right? It's the bird species that they could use that was something that you could measure and you could study and you could count and all that stuff. So who knows what the other birds need, but that's at least some kind of measurement. So if you want a few non-natives, sure, go for it. And you don't always have to put them in pots as long as they're not in the aggressive invasive category of, of non-native, right? I have a bunch of plants that came with my property, a bunch of shrubs and things that, you know, I'm not going to cut it all down. I would have, it would look like, you know, the Holocaust if I did that. There would be nothing in my yard if I cut down all the non-natives when I first moved in. So I'm slowly making the shift and I'm, but I took out immediately the barberry, which is highly invasive, the butterfly bush, which is proving to be invasive. Uh, let's see, I got rid of the forsythia because I'm allergic to it, so that was a thing. Um, I have massive amounts of honeysuckle bush, Asian honeysuckle bush, that's horrible, I cut that out. Uh, the autumn olive, another one, big invasive. You know, I got rid of the stuff that was gonna be obnoxious and spreading and bad for the environment. I left some of the more ornamental things that weren't such a problem. And that's how I made my decision. So that requires some research. You have to figure out who's good and who's bad and get involved with, you know, if you want to learn, go get involved with the weed warriors and you go out in the parks and you see what's out there and you go, okay, I need to get rid of those. So that's my recommendation. You don't have to keep them in pots though. Yeah, and I, I just adding to that. Oh, Lauren, did you want to say something else? Lauren Wheeler? No? Okay. Um, so something kind of related to that too, um, is that, you know, for the non-natives, you know, somebody was saying that you can plant if they aren't invasives. And I think that that's what Lauren was kind of saying too. Um, another thing too, is that you can have them in pots. Maybe they're invasive and you have them in a pot so they won't be able to spread through the roots if they are able to do that. But if they are invasive, they will continue to produce seeds. And that's, a problem, even if it's in a pot. Um, likewise, if they are on the ground, maybe you can have something that is non-native, but you kind of have to be on it. You know, you can't just put it in there and let it go and go do something else with your life for years because you need to keep an eye on that and make sure that that thing is not spreading. So I, at least, and this comes more from my gardening <laughs> experience, you know, it's like, but you know, there are some things that you're like, I really love this plant. I think this flower is lovely and I want this to be in my yard because it makes me happy. And you care about things spreading around, then maybe keep that thing, but pull the other ones around so that you're not spreading it everywhere. Um, if that is really, really, really important to you. But you know, sometimes the importance is relative. You know, maybe there's something else more important and you decide to take it out. 
So, okay, we have a few more questions. Um, is there a treatment for white flies that will not hurt pollinators? I'm going to suggest a good a hose with a good sprayer. <laughs> that's about the, you know, that's the least toxic way, right? Um, anything you spray is going to have impacts on something else. Okay. Um, when we mulch our leaves in the fall, does it hurt the insects who overwinter in the leaves? Is it better to mulch them in the fall or wait until spring? I, I, so, so this is like, I, I think the question is, are you, you're raking up your leaves and it depends on what you're doing with them. Are you putting them in bags and putting them at the curb? In which case, even the spring is kind of probably a little early for that. Cause I think there's still going to be insects in there overwintering and living in there. But, um, if you're chopping them up, you know, you're gonna chop up some larvae, that's gonna happen, It'd be a bit of a loss. Uh, it kind of depends on what you're doing with them, I think. Um, so this is, I see that there was kind of a part two to that. Somebody says, sorry, I meant shredding them and going over them with a mower. Okay. So essentially, if you collect your leaves and have some place in your yard where you can uh, pile the leaves, Again, you may not want to pile them so thickly because like with soils, if you pile things too thickly and if it gets really wet, it might mat down. And so the natural cycle may not be there. But if you have a place that you can put leaves and spread them out, then that would be great. And then yes, late in the spring or when it's your time to mulch, it's probably okay. To, I'm, I'm going to say this not as an entomologist, but as somebody who is trying to say like there will always be a cycle that's alive in your leaves so you just have to kind of make the decision if you're willing yeah. to mulch them then you might be disturbing that cycle or you may not be it just depends on whether or not that but the, or if you're very devoted create compost piles and actually have the compost piles do the decom decomposition on its own <laughs> Okay. Um, there's also a question here about is hort oil or neem oil harmful to beneficials? Again, I'm not an, an entomologist, but I would say that the way hort oil works is that it's more of a mechanical thing. So it's like you're spraying a small, um, uh, like a, 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 a thin layer of oil around the bug or the eggs in order to kind of suffocate it. So there has to be some beneficials that are going to be affected by that um, would be my two cents uh, on that. So if somebody else wants to uh, speak to that, that would be great. Oh my gosh, many of our properties were, I'm sorry, I'm taking your role, Judy. Um, okay. Go right ahead. Many I'm of our properties it. were planted with rhododendrons, azaleas, pyrus, japonica, mahonia, boxwood which thrive and are part shade or shady yards are these invasive harmful harmful and as we add in, in natives the only one that's truly invasive is mahonia so any of the mahonias that you have there at, whether that mahonia bilii or homo aquifolium you should be removing them but we are seeing more and more mahonia bilii which common's name is leather leaf mahonia showing up and jumping into our local um parks and native landscapes. So unfortunately you do need to take out the Mahonia if you have that commitment to that. And just add, add, add your natives. Like don't, you don't need to rip out your rhododendrons. You don't need to rip out your azaleas, but boy, won't it feel good when you do. And won't it feel great when you put in something that you see, you know, drawing attention. When you think of all those plants and our turf lawns, our landscapes of this area from the 60s, 70s, and 80s were ecological deserts, period, punto final. You know, it's just horrible. And so like every time you take out something like that and put it, put in a native plant, you just see things shift and change. And as you do that incrementally over time, it's massive. 
I'm just going to jump in for a second and check with Gina since we are at 830. We're just over it. If we can continue a little bit, if you guys are willing to stay on and answer a few more questions, or do we need to stop at 830, Gina? It's okay if you'd like to continue. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, are you all willing to stay on for a few more minutes to answer a few more questions? Great. Okay. Thank you. All right. So let's go back and see where we're at with, um, there's a question about native prairie grass. Um, where's that question? Whoever asked it, if you want to ask it. Um, I'm, I'm going to speak to that very gradually and then get it, you know, on a surficial level and Lauren Hubbard or somebody else can speak to it more. So in our area, we don't have native prairies except in very, very minor, um, in very, very confined areas. So we do tend to use uh, various kinds of grasses that replicate a prairie type ecosystem in our areas. And we, generally speaking, as urban, suburban individuals are accustomed to a lot more sun than what our natural landscape, which would be here, which would be like walking through Sligo Creek or Rock Creek where you, it's fully shaded. So the reality of the situation is, is how do we, as designers, how do we address that inclination that you want more sun, but our area is really designed to be fully shaded. So using some of our coastal plain plants or waterside plants or native plants from, so any of the, um, uh, though a shade bottle brush, buck, uh, bottle brush uh, grasses are great for shade, but the other things I would say is when we use our switch grasses, when we use our, uh, uh, um, now I'm uh, totally drawing the blank, the one that comes up when you put uh, broom grass, when you use broom grass, uh, panicums, even prairie drop seed grass, which is not local to this area or native to this area, these are creating an, um, a different environment that would not be naturally occurring, but they're replicating other ecosystems that we're borrowing from in the same way that no green roof is actually does well all native, okay? But you have to borrow from other areas on the East Coast um, to borrow their plants to put in your green roof. They're not indigenous green roofs, you know? So it's, it's, it's very complicated and it's, it, it's a individual decision on every part. And there's a huge spectrum of what works and what's okay to do. And you just have to make up your mind about what that is. Yeah, can I, can I follow on that a little bit? It is very complicated. There, uh, the Maryland Native Plant Society hosted a talk last year by a fellow who runs the Southeastern Grasslands Initiative. And he showed uh, some maps suggesting that at one point somewhere in this area and exactly where those lines are drawn, it's a little unclear, but there were grasslands. So it kind of depends on how far back you look, right? And then there's like unique little spaces that might've been grasslands. And then if you're getting into, if you follow Sam Drovey, he's the bee guy and you look at uh, what habitat native bees need most, and Anahi, you're way more comp way more qualified to talk about this than I am, but my understanding is that, you know, many of our, if not most of our native bees are actually ground nesting, and they really kind of like these dry, sandy little spots and things. So like in my backyard, I have this little hill where the grass is mown too low because it's kind of on this little arc and so the mower always cuts it really short and so it's really hot and dry and kind of and that you know what that's where all the bee holes are so i'm not going to do too much to that i'm gonna just let it be and be that kind of dry little spot so you know it's kind of depends on what like like what lauren miller said you know wh what are you trying to do what are you trying to accomplish and my suggestion is that you should avoid getting too hung up on all the details because it will just, oh, it's, it's overwhelming. Like trying to be perfect 
you can't, you can't be perfect. You just should just plant some stuff because pollinators will show up and you can get better at this and you'll keep trying and then you'll shift it around a little bit and you'll add things and you'll learn stuff and it'll get better. And that's how most of us did this from the beginning because there, there isn't really, you know, like an, a manual for this, really. There's some guides that help you a little bit, but it's ecology and it's a very complicated system. So trying to perfectly do this is, is probably simply not possible. So just try. Thank you. Uh, um, go ahead, go, oh, sorry. No, go ahead. No, I, I wanted to add to that because I, I think that, um, you know, I, I'm agreeing all the time. I'm like, yes, yes. Um, <laughs> <laughs> no, but I think that's something that to me is um, important when we try to do these things is that we need to understand that nature is not static and that um, it's diverse. And so, you know, we may have, as Lauren was saying, you know, bees, to, the ground nesting bees will like mostly places that are a little more open, but other bees will like places that have like twigs and branches and other bees will like little holes on the walls or something else. And so, you know, we can't copy nature because we're not able to do that. We, we can't do that. And so the best way to reproduce nature is actually letting those spaces exist and and letting transforming you know as the other lauren was saying uh you know this like deserts right and transforming that desert into a bunch of different ha types of habitats and so if you want to, if you love flowers you can plant flowers and then you leave a little corner a little more bare and that will be sufficient to support some bees and leaving some leaves in some other corner of your yard will be supporting butterflies and other organisms that nest in, in that and reproduce in there. And so it doesn't mean that all your yard has to be bare, that all your yard has to be covered in leaves, that all your yard has to be this one thing. It's really the key is trying to diversify, to have all these different types of spaces where all these different types of diverse organisms can be in, have a space to live in. And so I think that that's important. It's like there is no one solution. A little bit of everything is good. Great. Thank you. There's another question uh, that says, do any communities provide incentives for homeowners to plant natives and pollinators like tax credits? And I will just add that um, Mount Rainier, I don't know if they do tax credits, but they do have a city program where they actually provide native plants and do training and education to promote native plantings. Um, so I don't know if anybody, if any of you have any other thoughts on that. Yeah, I can, I can add that um, certainly if you're in, if you're in certain, so I understand Tacoma Park, I'm not sure has anything. So maybe, maybe that's a question for Kate, um, but, <laughs> but uh, there are a number of programs, the county, Montgomery County, if you're not in one of the incorporated cities, then you can qualify for their rainscapes programs. Uh, also, the city of Rockville and the city of Gaithersburg each have their own specific rainscapes program as well that's separate from the county. They each have their own different, you know, uh, amounts of rebate and things like that. So there are details for each that are a little bit different. But the idea behind all of those is that they're using you, you, you all as a, as a property owner, you pay a stormwater fee as part of your taxes. And that goes into a big pile of money that can gets redispersed to try to manage stormwater. So those rainscapes programs are designed to help manage stormwater and some of that money can be come back to you in the form of a rebate if you do green infrastructure projects on your property for the most part, I guess not all of them are green infrastructure, but mostly they are to, uh, to mitigate your stormwater um, flow off of your property, then you can get a rebate. They all require that you will be approved in advance for this rebate. So you have to apply and get it the plan approved and that sort of thing. But it is a way to recapture that. And then I know at least with the county program, they will reevaluate your tax bill and take a little chunk off if you do a project. So there, there's also one thing and, and maybe, you know, there's people here I was seeing at the beginning and many different places. I'm in College Park uh, and College, College Park became, um, uh, BCD USA 
um, certified city this year. And that certification comes with a number of actions that are taken. Um, and so that can also contribute to creating these uh, incentives and creating activities and, and um, you know, awards. The city of College Park also has um, um, a committee that has awards that are for environmental stuff to neighbors. And so those are actions that cities can take. Uh, and that will be rewarding kind of directly specific actions um, and members of the community. Um, the BCD USA also has another certification that is for campuses. And so there's a similar thing that is called B Campus USA. Um, and those certifications come with the need to do certain things. There is also a Monarch uh, pledge. So these are things that cities can do as a city. And so um, you know, there's the mayor here, so this is something for the mayor for uh, to come apart. But you know, there's people here that are members of some community somewhere, and so every person here has the ability to contact their representatives and ask about these things. And if you are interested or you would like to know more about the city USA, you can get in touch with me. Um, we have this committee in 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 College Park, and you know, we're happy to. Uh, share information and you know how to do these things if if you're interested. And I'll just say the city's come up, we don't do the rebates, but we're looking into a credit program now that we had redone our fee system and it's 846. And I don't need, necessarily need to go into all the reasons why we looked at College Park, we looked at what Montgomery County did and the investment in having a rebate program. Um, is huge in keeping that up and making sure that it's maintained versus having a credit program that we're looking at now. So, but incentives, bottom line, we yeah. need incentives and we need to be working together. So happy to answer questions on that offline. Right, and Lauren Wheeler posted, I forgot about the DC has the River Smart Homes program, which is a different thing where it's not, they actually will come in and plant your, your do a project for you, you don't even have to pay out. So that's a different way to go. Okay, we're just going to take a couple more questions because it is getting late and I, I appreciate everyone's time. Um, there's a question on is horticultural oil and neem oil harmful to or beneficial? I think we hit that already. That oh, was the one with the thin layer of oil. So if you have anything yeah. like that, it's going to impact. Okay. Yeah. Um, I think we did this also. Um, there was one about crepe myrtles. Um, how harmful are crepe myrtles? I'm hearing that they're starting to be uh, potentially invasive. That said, I have a really a huge one and I'm not cutting it down. So there you go. <laughs> okay. What's the best black eyed Susan? That one's answered in the chat. Um, oh yeah, River Smuts mentioned here. Okay, I think that's it. And I would just like to, unless anyone has anything else, questions? I so appreciate everybody's time for sticking around. And thank you so much for joining us. Uh, wish you happy planting and I'm very, very grateful to all four of you for joining us and speaking and sharing all of your wealth of information. Um, and happy planting to everyone as you add native plants and join in expanding the pollinator highway that we so need and reap the benefits of seeing more bees, butterflies, birds and bugs around. Um, and with that, unless anyone has anything else, I think we can say thank you again and thank you for joining us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye.